thank you so much for staying uh, with us. Time now for our Beyond the Scars conversation. And before I get to my guest, Dr. Pamela Odhiambo, just keep your feedback coming. I see a lot of it. I'll be sampling it at the end of this program so you can send it to KTNSKE -E at KTNSKE -E or at Grace Kuria KE. Dr. Dr. Pamela Odhiambo, the Migori Woman Representative, Karibu Sana. It's such an thank honor you. to have you on set today. Thank you, Grace. Okay. So, Doc, I know. Most people are waiting, you know, to hear that bit of what transpired on the 28th of October 2018. But here on Beyond This Cars, we start by sort of like helping our viewers understand where our guests come from. So let's do the same for you. Just give us a little background of who Dr. Pamela Odiambo is, apart from what we know already. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, Kenya. Allow me to first send a very hearty congratulatory message to our bishop, Kip Getich. Yes. Uh, I feel happy that God has ordained him to serve our country in that capacity at such a time as this. And uh, just to join the president, uh, being a born again Christian, I want to reiterate that uh, God is expecting the church to raise standards in Kenya. And I hope he will be there to stand in and make godly judgments over everything he does mm. in the church and out of the church. Congratulations once again, Bishop, and uh, the people of the North Rift. We are together with you. Allow me also to greet all the Christians watching me today. Uh, praise the Lord. I am Amen. born again, and I have the, love the Lord God so, so much that um, I think um, one of the dearest things I have in my life is salvation, nothing else. Otherwise, um, as you call me, I will start without the doctor part of me. I know myself as a, a young little girl born to the late Sebastian and Margaret in a small village uh, called Kiwiro or Diroma in North Kadem in Nyatike constituency of Migori County. My full name is Pamela Awor Ocheng. Ocheng is my father, mm. Odiambo, who is my beloved husband. And um, I grew up in this family of about 13 girls. At some late stage, my mother got one boy. So we were born 14 in my family. Uh, some of us passed on, but about um, 10 or so of us grew up to adulthood. Since then, others have uh, died also. Um, I have about uh, five other siblings who are still alive. So I thank God for that. I am married, and I am a mother of uh, 11 beautiful children, Eleven seven boys children. and four girls. Wow. That's, those are my biological children, uh, together with many others that I have uh, mothered over the years. Um, I have many children, now also including Migori County as a whole, together with uh, very many young people across Kenya um, who've, uh, whom I have touched their life, or they have touched my life in one way or another. Apart from that, uh, I went to school in this little village uh, for a year uh, at Diroma Primary School, I think for a term. And then I moved on to Agongo Primary School, which is located in Awendo constituency, the then Rongo constituency, but currently it's Awendo constituency. And I grew up here for much of my primary school life uh, doing my class eight exams in uh, 1985, and thereby joining Dede Girls, which is still part of Awendo constituency. And I think I spent my early formative stages of life around this region before I moved on to Kenyatta University, where I did my Bachelor of Education course, uh, majoring in French and Business Studies. And I moved on to teach French in high school. And over the years, uh, besides the teaching, I decided to upgrade myself. So I went back to Kenyatta to get my master's 
in business administration, strategic management option. And um, I moved on to PhD uh, at uh, Jomo Kenyatta University on the same line. Um, but I taught French for in business studies at high school for about 20 years. Then later on, I did uh, another lecturing uh, for about eight years in, um, at uh, Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology. And this is where I left uh, in the month of uh, about May when I was going for this elective post in 2017. And so that is a brief of my training and professional background. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, I would like to reemphasize, I am born again and a very staunch Christian. Uh, I got born again as a little girl the year that I was supposed to be in class six. That was uh, um, 19, uh, I think it was 1984. But then my teacher, the late Riaga, Nyakonya from Kogelo promoted me to class seven. And uh, in that year, early that year, uh, something small happened. I got very sick at school and it reminded me that uh, whenever I was sick back at home, I would see my dad pray over me and I would get well. So when I went back home in a hurry after we closed school, I was like, dad, I want to know this God myself so that when this headache, which really uh, messed me up, I didn't like missing classes at all at all. But this sickness put me down for about two weeks. And I thought if my dad was here, he would pray for me and then I would get well. So I thought I wanted to have this God myself so that I could talk to him. And that's the question I asked my dad when I went back home. And he told me there was salvation. So he taught me about salvation. I gave my life to Christ. Later on, when I was at high school, I think he prayed over me again. I got filled with the Holy Spirit. And I've been born again all my life. I think it is something valuable that I really have to echo uh, that um, I am born again and I am a Christian. I love God and I love just being born again. It wow. is nice. The Otherwise, uh, currently, uh, I think a bit of what people now know about me. I hail from Suna West, same county, Migori County, and right now I am serving as um, the Migori County Women Representative. But I've not also relinquished my duties as a spiritual leader in my church, which is called Nairobi Miracle Land Worship uh, Church, which is based here in Nairobi at Maringo. So that is me in a nutshell. You are a leader in your church? Yes. Mm -hmm. I have uh, over the years led the women ministry and my main ministry has been uh, about the young people and especially the young couples. But I'm a preacher of the word, I'm a teacher of the word mm -hmm. and I've seen God do things uh, through his word. So that is maybe a bit of me that uh, many people who now meet me on the political arena may not really get to know. I am an intercessor, I am a singer, I like worshiping God, and uh, all these things. I know I've not done all of them to a real national level, but uh, uh, there are great aspects of me that uh, I would not uh, love to let die. Certainly, and we're glad to hear all yes. that for the first time here on Beyond the Scars. Yes. Uh, Dr. Terry, I'd like you to talk to us about something that happened to you when you were growing up that sort of like shaped your life, especially because you <coughs> say you came from a family of uh, 13 girls. There was the other boy that came in, but 13 girls. And uh, in those days, the perception of, you know, there must be a boy in the family from the society. Talk to us about that. Hmm. Wow, that's very technical. I would have loved my father to talk about it, but now that is not there. Uh, let me try. Uh, being born in this family, we were all healthy and very brilliant children. But you know, uh, these days we talk about women's rights and we keep championing and fighting for the space of the woman. It is not something that has started now. Uh, as I was growing up in this little, uh, family, in this little village, I noted when I became of, at least as far I can, as I can remember, there was this pressure on my dad to marry and get boys. And I think it, it was not only a pain 
that uh, was on my father or my mother, being the mother of the girls, uh, God rest her soul in peace, I, I can't understand exactly what she went through with this kind of situation around her, to the extent that the, the mother of my father kept even pushing, you know, the mother of my father kept pushing him to marry. But you see, my father was born again, he was a preacher, and I think he believed in this... Uh, theory that uh, he shouldn't marry, he would serve God the way he was, which he actually did until the death of my mother, when uh, uh, having left his home, all of us, he had to marry somebody else uh, to take charge of whatever uh, females could do in this home. And uh, I think as I was growing up, I kept wondering, are we not children? Why are people ridiculing my father? And strangely enough, my father trained us to do anything that anybody could do. You know, in my culture, when young men grow up to a certain age, 14, 18, the teens, they, 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 they build some small cottage. It is called Simba. They no longer sleep in their mother's or grandfather's houses. So they build some, some small room that uh, they call Simba. And so we had no Simba in our home. But later on, my father lived with a cousin, uh, a son to, to, to his sister. And uh, this guy built a Simba, but some stage he left, so there was no more. And when I grew to the university, <laughs> I built my Simba in my own father's home. We were given some small money in the name of, uh, we used to call it Padiem or yes. whatever it was. Um, and I uh, used this money to buy materials and uh, my father helped me to contract, uh, construct this, this small room where we were now. Uh, sleeping as the, the, the girls who are still there. And the pain was that we were not regarded as children by the community around. And this pained me. One particular episode that uh, I thought really changed my thinking as a little girl in that home, there was this day somebody confronted my father with a war over the piece of land that he owned. We still own the land. I have its title deed. And uh, this man... This, the community were like, the land is so big, she, it doesn't have sun, so everybody wanted to grab for their own children this piece of land. And there was this afternoon, my father was looking after the little cows that uh, we had. Um, and this man just chucked out of his home, got a spear, and he ran from behind of my father. And he wanted to spear him because of this uh, controversy over the land. But somebody saw him and shouted, and my father ran very quickly and jumped over the sisal fence into our home. And that thing, I was watching, I was somewhere there, and I saw all of it. And that thing really, really hurt me. I felt like, really, if we were sons, maybe somebody would have not done this to my father. But then I said, what can I do about it? Now that I'm so little, I cannot fight this guy, but I would like to protect my, my parents. And this thing made me vow to go to school. I think that time I was so little, I must have been around class two or class three. It was, I was a tiny little thing. And I said, I want to go to school and when I shall have been blessed to get money, my first agenda was I wanted to build a, a, a stone wall around that over 30 acres of land <laughs> of my dad. And I thought that would give them peace so that somebody would not come to intrude and do that kind of thing. It, it really pained me, but it shaped my thinking. I decided I would go to school no matter what. I decided I would not uh, veer off. I really focused on going to school because I thought somehow I needed to get away out of this situation. My parents were relatively poor, subsistent farming, a few cows which he got after the marriage of some of these girls who were ahead of me. I uh, was the eighth born, eighth born in my family. So these ladies, due to that pressure, you know, they used to call them Ogwang. Ogwang is um, a wild cat, you know, these, uh, these wild animals, you know. O the Ogwang. concept of uh, girls in Luoland was this of Ogwang, so that even if your little daughter of, uh, say, 14 or 15 years died in your home, the Luos insisted that girl had to be buried elsewhere, <laughs> maybe by an in-law, something like that, that you can't bury them. In. So it was like... We were really not children. And I think um, the feeling that uh, uh, we were not children pained me a lot. 
I don't know whether it pained my other sisters. Some of them succumbed to that pressure and they actually got married uh, without uh, finishing their studies. Uh, majority of them left at class seven, primary school. But I chose from that day to make it and make that community know that girls are also children. And I'm so far so glad that uh, God has actually allowed me to be where I am today. And uh, today, my father and mother are deceased. But I think even my uncles and everybody else who is in my uh, community appreciate the fact that uh, I am a child and a child to them. And I've really tried to be a good daughter to them whenever there is an issue. They have funerals, they have this need, they have daughters and sons. I've taken quite a number to school and they appreciate. And I thank God they have also supported us a lot despite the uh, absence of my own parents. So it's good. Great. Fast forward now to 28th October. 2018. Mm. Talk to us about that morning before the accident happened. Uh, you know, how are you, your, your spirits and everything? Talk to us about that. Wow, Grace, that morning was just another morning. It was a good morning, according to me. I know I was feeling a little tired because um, the previous week I had just traveled from Denmark. Then we had a bit of rigorous activities in Parliament. Then uh, there was this uh, uh, program we had created. I sit in the education committee, and there were issues around that time with the universities and funding and things like that, and the strikes. And so we set out as a committee to visit especially the smaller universities, which uh, some of which, according to the government, should uh, either be recombined with their mother universities or something like that. But uh, uh, I personally thought some of these universities, however small they were, needed to be left and funded and made to grow. Why? Because I've watched with a lot of regret that, uh, yes, we have the, the major established universities, but some of the children, young people like from my county and other uh, far-flung regions like Northeastern and everywhere, they suffer in Nairobi and the environs where these major universities are because currently as we sit here, you know, the university at some stage said they would concentrate on their major mandate, the service, the training. But where these people live, what they eat should be the, the, the parents' problem and their own problem. And indeed, to some, it is a true problem to the extent that some of these guys from poor families, even coming from, say, Migori County, Muhuru Bay, to Nairobi or to Mombasa Polytechnic or to Meru, these guys may have to sell the land to raise even just transport or call an Arambe or something like that. Guys are really suffering. And so my thinking has been, let us have at least a well-established, quality-providing um, service university in each county to save our young people from this kind of harassment uh, struggling to live in Nairobi where um, rent is high, food is high, everything is high, and yet they don't have the money. And so we went on a mission of this nature just to go around the universities, and we started off from the, West, uh, the Western region. So we went uh, the previous two days to Kisi University, then to Rongo University. We went and slept in uh, Kisumu. Then the following day, we went to Jaramogi Odinga, and then we finished at Maseno. So while at Maseno, I had been away for some time, and uh, there was some work going on in my home. Some guys were planting for me trees. So I thought I wanted to dash home and uh, sort out these people. And uh, I went home, though reaching late. The following day, there was an arambe, a fundraising for women that uh, Honorable Wanga had uh, invited me to, and uh, this Arambe was to be provided, uh, presided over by uh, Honorable Gideon Moy. And I was to go to this Arambe. In fact, when I reached Homa Bay that evening, we met with the Honorable Wanga, uh, where he, she was uh, arranging for the, <laughs> the function. She really pleaded with me to go and stay with her for the night, but I said, no, I have to reach home. So I went home. I did what I thought I could do. Then early in the morning, I was actually ready to go back to Homa Bay. My intention was to go and get Gladys. We first go to church, 
then we go to the function. And uh, I woke up early. I was tired, but very happy in my heart. I had no issues. Though at some stage, I thought I had little money. So I was like, do I go to this function? Do I send somebody else? And I remember asking my um, later security person, Hastings, for which God rest his soul in peace, uh, how do, whom do I get whom I can send to this function? He encouraged me to go. The guy adamantly insisted that we go to Oma Bay. So we took some breakfast. Personally, I just took a cup of porridge. I like, I like porridge. In the morning, I take porridge. So I took a cup of porridge, and I called them in to pray so that we leave. I always pray before I go anywhere in my home. It's almost my nature. So when I stood up to pray, something unique happened that later on when I recalled, I realized there was something that needed to do to happen this day. A spirit spoke to me and said, pray for divine protection. You need divine protection. And so I, I said nothing to God that day except crying about divine protection for calling my limbs, every part of my body by name and all these people I had and the vehicle and everything. So we left. And as I was leaving my gate, uh, I was wondering, why divine protection? Why do I need protection in Oma Bay? But instead of this uh, answer or any answer, a song came into my heart and started singing powerfully. There was a congregation saying, Almighty God, that is your name. You will never share your glory with anyone. You know? So this song sang, and I, I joined the singing, and the phones would interrupt. We would be talking in the car and laughing. But then I would be singing. And I sang like that until we reached this particular place around we know where the accident took place. So before the morning, I mean the accident, to me it was a, a normal morning. Uh, except I was feeling a little tired, which I attributed to, to this exercise that we had had over the past few days. Um, when we reached this place, we know around Rongo, past Rongo town, I was reading some uh, gazette which I picked from Rongo. And this place is fairly straight. It's not a very bad area. One would not expect the kind of thing that happened to me there. So from afar, I was seeing a group of border border guys. There was a small section on this side. They were completely off the road, but on both sides of the road. So one of them had uh, positioned himself like he wanted to take off to the same direction where we were going. Uh, he was holding a phone on his left hand. I could remember speaking on phone and uh, the right hand holding the, the piki piki and the, the, the left foot on the ground with this one on the pedal. So he spoke and as we were approaching, he finished the talking and slipped the phone in his pocket and took off. There was no conflict, uh, it was okay. But all of a sudden as we were trying to overtake him, he moved like he was speeding to, to go ahead of us. But still on the, the side lane, it was fine. Then all of a sudden, this guy just made a U-turn right in front of us. And uh, I lifted my hands and said, Jesus, what is this man doing? Before I finished this statement, I turned to see what my driver would do. But then I realized he had lost it. So what I saw was the vehicle zooming into the air. And I started saying, God, take charge. I'm not dying in this accident. And what happened, I heard us rolling, 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 then boom. Strangely enough, I never lost conscience in this, all this period. So when the vehicle landed, all I could see around me was darkness. And uh, I kept insisting that Jesus must rescue me from this death. I'm not dying. My chest was so tight with this belt, and I uh, was now gasping for breath. But I would struggle to take a deep breath and say, Jesus, come and rescue me. So I could hear these people outside here saying, all these people are dead. Whoever is in this vehicle is dead. But uh, somebody was saying, no, I can hear somebody talking. Somebody is praying. So they pushed the vehicle, I think, and another big bang. Then I saw light. I thought God wanted me to leave. 
but this belt was killing me. So I was trying to remove it. I found this hand was already dead. I tried moving this one, it was not moving. So they started cutting something, tuck, tuck. Then the spirit was telling me, pray that they don't hurt you further than that. And I said, God, help whoever it is not to hurt us further than that. So they ripped something open. I saw a hand stretch towards me. I said, this belt is, is killing me. And this person reached out to the belt and they removed it, so I breath normally. Okay. And Actually, I started just, thanking God. Let me cut you short, because yes. I'm told we need to take a break. Yeah. But of course, we'll take it from there after the break. Yeah. So there's a lot of feedback from you guys um, uh, at Len Mark Ogonda saying, we thank God for your life. Keep going. We love you. Martin Shikuku says, glory to God for your life. And a lot of it, a lot more rather, which I'll be sampling at the end of this program. So keep it coming at Grace Kurya KE at KTN News KE. Let's take that break. Stay with us.